Hi guys and welcome to a different type of a book haul. I mean it's still a book haul but the source of these books is different. So um, welcome to everyone that is new to my channel. <laughs> um, thank you so much for subscribing and welcome back to those who have been here before. If you've been here for a little bit If you have been here since um, January, at some point in January, you will ha know if you've seen the video. I mentioned it in like one or two videos. My grandma, this is my mom's mom, so my maternal grandmother, passed away in January, the beginning of January, like the 9th or something like that. Um, just standard death due to old age type of a thing. So, and we were expecting it because her health was going downhill. So my mom and I went to Colorado to try to finalize a couple of things. We're in the process. Um, there's a realtor involved. Um, as far as I know, there is a bid in to buy her home. Her home is now cleaned out. So we were just kind of finalizing a couple of things and going through a couple of odds and ends. Like my grandma absolutely loved to scrapbook. So we were going through all the photos and photo albums that she had and scrapbooks to determine which of her three kids, so my, my mom or my, one of my two aunts, would get each particular item. And then just kind of divvying up between the three groups. So my aunt and her children, my other aunt and her children, and my mom and myself. Uh, my mom um, is taking possession of my grandma's glider and um, they asked what I wanted and I said I'll take her books. If no one wants any of her books, I will take her books. So I have two bags here. The one you see me holding up is this bag. Very light. Um, I Let me see if I can even lift this other one. I'll get to the other bag in a second. There is a green bag here and it is full. It's heavy. So I'm not even going to try and lift it because it's it's full. So I have gone through the books. There are some books that she had that were duplicates that she had. Like there's this cozy mystery series that deals with knitting. Um, she gave me while she was still alive the duplicates. So she had like cast on, kill off or something. That's just an example. But she had, would have like two copies of that book. So I got all the duplicates. So I went through all of the books. Um, the Cozy Mystery series, I had all of those that she had. There's another couple of books that she had that um, that I had. So, and then there were two books that my mom actually wanted. So my mom got those two books, which are both middle grade books. And the rest I have. Now there are some nonfiction <laughs> there is some, I believe there's some Christian fiction and some other books. So let's go ahead and get into, get into this. I have not read the synopsis on any of these. There's one author I recognize. There's a couple of nonfiction that I know the umbrella <laughs> is the best word I can think of. So these, again, these were my grandma's books. And some of these are books I would never have picked up, but because they're my grandma's, I do want to, some of them I want to read because I know there's three books in here that she got because she loved, one is a TV scrapbook, she loved that show, and two are like biographies of two men that she really enjoyed their music and their creative outlet. I think one was an actor or they both were or singers or something like that. I don't know enough about those two individuals, but I know that one was a singer at the very least. So, and she loved his music. We'll get into that. So let's go ahead and delve in. I'll show you the books that are now mine, that were my grandma's, that are now mine. So, okay. Um, let's go ahead and start with the TV scrapbook. Uh, <laughs> Whenever my mom and I would go and visit my grandma, we would watch a lot of Alfred Hitchcock um, as far as like the TV Alfred Hitchcock presents, but we have that on DVD. My grandma liked that. She also liked to watch The Twilight Zone. She loved to watch Forensic Files with me. Um, she liked the British comedy show Keeping Up Appearances. And 
she absolutely loved the show the Andy Griffith show so I have the Andy Griffith TV scrapbook um, she absolutely loved this and so we would always watch several episodes when they aired she had cable so whatever was on rerun, rerun we would watch together with her uh, so a lot of good memories with this I like I have not seen all of the episodes from what I have seen I have enjoyed um, so it's just yeah a lot so this will have a lot of information oh there's a little bit about Matlock because Andy Griffith played Matlock as well um, here's a thing about Don as he played uh, Barney Fife uh, so you're gonna have stuff about Don Knotts was that guy's name so yeah I think this will be an interesting read I do like the TV scrapbooks because I do like to see behind the scenes I like to see images of the actors and actresses there's 8B so yeah I think this will be fun she absolutely loved the show and I absolutely loved watching it with her um, so yeah, I'll get to that at some point. So there's my non a nonfiction. Now, another nonfiction here. I think that's fiction. I think that's Christian. Christian. Okay, two non. Two that I absolutely know are nonfiction. Uh, one is a little spoonful of chicken soup for the mother's soul. I, the chicken soup for the soul took off in the 90s. Chicken soup for the pet lover's soul. Chicken soup for the animal lover's soul. Chicken soup for the mothers, for the grandmothers, for the nurses, for the teachers, for the... You insert whatever. Um, there was a whole bunch of them. It took off in the 90s, and I had a lot of them. For the teens, for the teen soul volume 2, 3, pre, there's pre-teens, there, there was a bunch. So, and they're just a collection of short stories. Um, oh, this is from my cousin. My cousin gave this to her. Anyway, um, so just a little spoonful. It looks like they're little quotes um, or just little mini stories. So just a little, that'll be quick to get through. Okay, this other one that's a nonfiction um, is, I think he was a singer. The name sounds, I think he was a singer. Um, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if he did acting too. But I know at the very least he was a singer. But that's Johnny Cash. Uh, Grandma loved his, his work. And this book is called Man in Black by Johnny Cash. It says, God's superstar tells his own story in his own words. So, let's see. Many of those around me, for those seven years I took drugs, expected me to die any day. Most of them gave up on me more than once. But I knew I wasn't going to die then. I was running from God and whatever he wanted me to do. But I knew I'd tried before, I'd tire before he would, and I'd make the change before he gave up on me, and he never did. So I gave up, reached up, and pulled me, and he pulled me to my feet. And then there's, it says there's 16 pages of photos. So a biography of Johnny Cash. That's all I know about that. She loved his voice and things like that. Okay, moving on, I have the Chris... Christmas Cookie Killer by Livia J. Washburn. Uh, let's see. Now some of the books, and I don't know which one, I know they're part of a series. There's like five or six that are like the second book, the sixth book, the fifteenth book in a series. I don't remember what ones they are, but I do believe they're ones that you can all read as standalones because she didn't read them in <laughs> any particular order. And so yeah. Uh, but I like to read things in order, so I have ordered the first book of those. Two of those have arrived already, um, and so I'm expecting, I think, I think just three more. So, anyway. Okay, this one says, so the cr Christmas cookie killer, it says there's recipes inside. Um, oh, for a stuffed zucchini, chocolate pecan pie, pumpkin pie, there's a bunch of recipes at the back. Okay. Phyllis would like to think she's just entering the Christmas cookie contest for fun, but that's not exactly true. She can't manage anyone beating her, beating her delicate snowflake-shaped lime sugar cookies, although her friend Carolyn's pecan shortbread, along with her neighbor Mrs. Simmons' ginger doodles, might give her a run for her money. 
Then, after her annual Christmas cookie exchange, Phyllis heads over to elderly Mrs. Simmons' home and finds the poor thing in a pile of lime sugar cookies, strangled by the belt of her own bathrobe. With a number of names on Santa's naughty list, this, is, this case is a cookie Phyllis means to crumble. So cozy mystery. She liked cozy mysteries. Okay, next up I have The Morning Dove, A Story of Love by Larry uh, Barkdoll. Um, oh, at least when this was written, this guy, this author was from Utah, so I'm wondering... I know there are some Christian fiction books, and I'm thinking this might be one of them. It's at the time of this book being published, which I don't know when it was published. Let's see. Um, 1996 and 1997. So in the late 90s, the author lived in Orem, Utah, with his wife and their ten children. So, okay. It says, A tender story of growing up, exploring life, and discovering the boundaries and the defining moments of love. The year is 1959 in Boise, Idaho. Nine-year-old Hannibal has lost his parents and moves in with his recently widowed grandfather, Pop. Hannibal grows up under the loving guidance of Pop, who subtly imparts life's important lessons, the responsibility that comes with love, the nature of charity, respect for all living things, and the dangers in telling a lie. So, that's th that's it. So, okay. I'm going to do a separate pile for the nonfiction. Okay, and then fiction. Okay. Uh, next up I have uh, Snow Angels by Fern Michaels, but I think this is a collection of shorter stories, like novellas possibly. I mean, this book is just over 400 pages. It's 421 pages. There's three authors list listed, so I think each author wrote kind of a shorter story. Um, Marie Bostwick, Jana McMahon, and Rosalind Noonan. So, Snow Angels. Um, this was a... Um, or are there... Oh, there's four stories in this. So Fern Michaels actually wrote Snow Angels. And then Marie Bostwick has a story called The Presence of Angels. And Jana McMahon wrote Decorations. And Rosalind Noonan wrote Miracle on Main Street. So there's four stories in this book. This, oh, this one she got here in Utah at my local library. Um, and this was one that was at a library book sale she got from the library when she visited here at some point. And so unfortunately there are library stickers on the back. So I can't tell you two of the synopsises. Um, so the one for the presence of angels says, ex Raquette Kendra, Kendra Loomis doesn't regret giving up New York's bright lights to be a Vermont minister's wife. But their small town's Christmas countdown is becoming a major stress fest, and the only way she can save the day is to prove that giving is the most precious gift of all. And then the one called Decorations by Jana says, All Michael Duncan wanted for Christmas was a new life, and by helping her ailing mother she found one, as a manager of a charming holiday craft store. She never expected that the uh, fragile benefits would be muscular sculptor Baxter Brown and one last chance to make all her wishes come true. I can't read the synopsis of the other two short stories because there are stickers covering them. So, but that's at least those two. Next, these are both Christmas fiction and I don't know if they're Christian Christmas fiction or just Christmas fiction. This one is called The Christmas Pearl. The Best Gifts Are Unexpected by Dorothea Benton Frank. And let's see. Oh, she only got to like page 10 in this. Anyway, okay. Uh, Theodora is the matriarch of a family that has grown into a bunch of uh, trusculent knuckleheads. Okay. 
uh, while she's finally gotten them all together in South Carolina to celebrate, this Christmas looks nothing like the extravagant homey holidays of her childhood. What happened to the days when Christmas meant tables groaning with home-cooked goodies, over-the-top decorations, and long chats in front of the fire with Pearl, her grandmother's beloved housekeeper and close confidant. Luckily for Theodora, a special someone who heard her plea for help arrives. With pockets full of enough gula magic and common sense to make Theodora's Christmas the love-filled miracle it's meant to be. So, the Christmas pearl. Uh, this other one that is a Christmas fiction, again, I don't know if it's a Christian Chris Christmas fiction, but that's The Gift by Richard Paul Evans. Um, this one has deckled edges, which I hate. Uh, let's see. The time of publishing this. I think this one's a Christian fiction. Um, this guy, at the time of publishing this, lived in Salt Lake City. And I've heard of, I think there's even a song called The Gift. Um, and it's definitely kind of uh, Christian-themed, I would think, or feeling. This one says, There is no hurt so great that love cannot heal it. Nathan Hurst hated Christmas. For the rest of the world, it was a day of joy and celebration. For Nathan, it was simply a reminder of the event that destroyed his childhood until a snowstorm, a canceled flight, and an unexpected meeting with a young mother and her very special son would show him that Christmas is indeed the season of miracles. From the beloved author of the international bestseller, The Christmas Box comes another timeless story of faith, hope, and healing. So yes, this one's going to be a Christian fiction one. Okay, um, that's all from that bag. <laughs> this other one's full. Okay. All right, the ones on top, I have a middle grade, and this is the author. I really enjoy this author's work. Uh, this middle grade, Mary Downing Hahn, Deep and Dark and Dangerous. That is a creepy cover with that baby doll. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Summer at the Lake House with wonderful Auntie Dulce and little Emma. Allie can't wait. Her mother Claire, Dulcie's sister, says the lake is dangerous and refuses to let Allie go. But Allie prevails and takes off for an idyllic vacation. Except it isn't. A spiteful girl named Sissy spoils everything. She's bratty and hostile and Emma imitates her. Sissy won't stop talking about something that happened years ago when Dulcie and Claire were Allie's age, a drowning under mysterious, under mysterious circumstances. Allie thinks Sissy is trying to scare her with a ghost story, but secrets from the past rise re relentlessly to the surface as Allie struggles to keep Sissy from destroying the people she loves. Okay. Um, Nonfiction is Chicken Soup for the Mother's Soul. This one's a hardback. I don't see anyone writing in this or if my grandma bought it or anything. So this is just a collection of short stories. Uh, it says it pays, play, pays tribute to motherhood, the universal calling that requires the skills of master, mediator, mentor, cook, and counselor. Heartwarming stories celebrate the defining moments of motherhood, from the triumphant to the trivial, from giving birth to developing mother's intuition, from making special memories and, sur and surviving family life to letting go. So, yeah, I know from my experience with reading various chicken soup books, and I've never read Chicken Soup for the Mother's Soul because I'm not a mother, and so I never felt like I could relate to this, but I would love to be a mother someday. Anyway, um, I'll still read this. It was my grandma's. And I bet, I think my mom probably got this for her, but I could be wrong on that. So there's a nonfiction. Okay, back to fiction. I have uh, Paperboy by Vince Vater. V-A-W-T-E-R. So it's literally Vater. It says, reminiscent of To Kill a Mockingbird. Okay, I like that book. Little man throws the meanest fastball in town, but talking is a whole different ball game. He can barely say a word without stuttering, not even his own name. So when he takes over his best friend's paper route for the month of July, he's not exactly looking forward to interacting with the customers. But it's the neighborhood junkman, a bully and thief, who stirs up real trouble in little man's life. So, paper boy. Okay. This next one is uh, Sarah's Quilt by Nancy E. Turner. And this is one I 
have, I think I have a book from this author. I don't remember the name of that book. Does it say in here? These is my words. I have that. And that one is actually signed by the author. This one's not. But this is another book by that same author. So we'll see if I like the author's writing. This one says, Sarah's Quilt, the long-awaited sequel to These Is My Words, continues the dramatic story of Sarah Agnes Pine, uh, beloved by readers and book clubs from coast to coast. These Is My Words told the spellbinding story of an extraordinary pioneer woman and her struggle to make a home in the Arizona territories. That's all I'm going to say because this is a sequel, so I don't want to spoil myself for the first book. So I'm going to leave that there. Um, and that's just a sequel. Okay. Up next. Um, let's see. I think I'm wondering if I got this next book from my grandma, but it's another nonfiction, and it's the other Chicken Soup. Uh, chicken Soup for the Grandma's Soul. So again, just a collection of short stories celebrating memories that we make at the times we cherish with grandmothers, the women who can be both who can both spoil and be stern, who provide unconditional love and invaluable wisdom, who can share sage advice while sharing an ice cream. So, Chicken Soup for the Grandmother's Soul, all about short stories about grandmothers. So, just a collection of nonfiction short stories. This next one is, I do know, I think these next, I think these next three are Christian fictions. So, this next one is called, the, I know this one is, uh, Christian fiction. Come Let Us Adore Him. Selected Scriptures with Christmas Reflections by Thomas Kincaid. So, it has a little ribbon here. It says it's genuine bonded leather. Um, and it's just the God of all creation. Born is the King, the Prophecy Fulfilled, and then you have a bunch of uh, Thomas Kincaid's artwork throughout the book to go with what is in here. So, I have that. Um, okay. Next up, also with by Thomas Kincaid, is Romantic Europe. And this one is a non-fiction that tells you about, tells you about in various places in Europe. For example, I opened up to this one, which is about Ireland. It has Ireland's national anthem. It tells you about, looks like it talks about a little, oh, quote by, from Macbeth by William Shakespeare. Um, let's see. The village of Castle Wales. So it has artwork. So it's just about a def diff bunch of different places. Um, in Europe. So we have the Luxembourg Gardens and uh, Lighting the Way is what this one is called. I'm not sure what that one's about. Venice Canal. So that'll be interesting. So, yep, there's a nonfiction. Okay, this next one is a fiction and it's another Christmas. This is a bunch of different stories. It's Santa's Christmas Storybook. So, uh, compile, it says by Santa Claus. It looks like it's compiled by someone named Turner. Uh, let's see. So, the various Christmas stories. We have Christmas Tree Soup, Snowball, the Naughty Christmas Kitten, Icod, the Ice Troll, the Perfect Christmas Present, a Christmas Angel. I think I have a picture book of the Christmas Angel. A Toy's Christmas, the Wild Sleigh Ride, the Christmas Tree. I think I have an individual book of that. The Teddy Bear Christmas, the Real Santa Claus, and the Amazing Adventure of Marco McSweeney. So we've got a lot of, and then of course it has pictures, a lot of Christmas short stories. So, yeah. And I'm assuming that's going to be by various authors, uh, authors just compiled by someone with the last name of Turner. Okay, next up I have Cross Creek by Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings. I don't remember if this one is a fiction or a non-fiction. Um, 
Let's see. So that's what that one looks like. It says, originally published in 1942, Cross Creek has become a classic in modern American literature. For the millions of readers raised on The Yearling, here is the story of Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings' experiences in the remote Florida hamlet of Cross Creek, where she lived for 13 years, from the daily labors of managing a 72-acre orange grove to bouts with runaway pigs and a succession of unruly farmhands. Rawlings describes her life at the Cross Creek with humor and spirit. Her tireless determination to overcome the challenges of her adopted home in the Florida back country, her deep rooted love of the earth and her gen genius for character and description result in most delightful and heartwarming memoir. So nonfiction. Okay. That answers that. Okay. Next up, I believe this is a Christian as well one. Oh my heck. This is one that was gifted to my grandma by my mom, but you know how families do it. They do signed by the one person, their spouse, and any children. That's what happened here. It says, Mom, this is one of our favorite speakers. He is a fabulous writer, too. I hope you enjoy it. So this is a Christian one, and it has my dad's name, my mom's name, and my name. So this was before they divor divorced. Um, we can become pure in heart, and we ought to strive all the days of our lives to do so. For Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So writes Elder Vaughn J. Featherstone, member of the First Quorum of the Seventy of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In this book, Elder Featherstone explains the many aspects of purity of heart, including purity and the temple purity and forgiveness, purity and motherhood, purity and the home, purity and good music, purity through discipline and work, purity and love, and purity in adversity. He includes numerous stories about purity from his own experiences, from the lives of the prophets, and from the lives of many others who exemplify purity of heart. Elder Featherstone's persuasive teachings and, and touching stories will inspire the reader to seek for greater, purity, for greater purity of heart in every aspect of life. Okay, so it's like a talk, it sounds like. A long talk. Up next, I have another Thomas Kincaid, Light Posts for Living, The Art of Choosing a Joyful Life. Oh, there's an image of Thomas Kincaid. Uh, let's see. In my paintings, I try to create worlds of tranquility, joy, and beauty. My prayer is that the principles in this book will help each of us lead lives that radiate these same qualities. Okay, so he's, so this is a biography and it has some of his artwork in there. So about Thomas Kincaid. So she loved his art until she found out he slept around with other women and then she didn't like him so much. So I've dumped the rest of the books out. So I'm just gonna go <laughs> from top of the pile to the bottom. Uh, first, okay, this one is, I do know is a nonfiction. I don't know who this person is, but I guess I'll find out. The book is called Coal Miner's Daughters by Dot Coal Miner's Daughter by Loretta Lynn, with George Vesey. Um, that's what that looks like. How a coal miner's daughter made it from Butcher Holler to, Hall, yeah, Holler to Nashville. It's funny, sad, intense, but what makes it is Loretta Lynn herself. Just folks, but a remarkable combination of innocent strength and county shrewdness. Oh, that's from Publisher Weekly. Um, so I'm guessing it's a memoir or a biography, and then of course there's pictures um, of whoever this Loretta lady is, so I, I will find out. Okay, so there's a nonfiction. Um, up next I have The Wedding Quilt. This, I think this one's part of a series, but I'm assuming it can be read as a standalone because this is the only one in that series that my grandma had. And this was written by Jennifer uh, Chiaverini. Again, this, oh, she got this one from the library cell because it has the barcode and the name of the library, which is the one that I go to. This one says, Sarah McClure arrived at Elm Creek Manor as a newlywed, never suspecting that her quilting lessons with master quilter Sylvia 
Bergstrom Compson would inspire the successful and enduring business Elm Creek Quilts, whose members have nurtured a circle of friendship spanning generations. As the wedding day of Sarah's daughter Caroline approaches, Sarah's thoughts are filled with brides of Elm Creek Manor past and present. The traditions they honored, the legacies they bequeathed, the wedding quilts that contain their stories on every stitch. Because Sarah learned the craft after her marriage, she had no wedding quilt, only one to commemorate her first anniversary. When the young bride confides in her mother a single fervent wish, I wish I had a wedding quilt, one I made myself, Sarah yearns to grant it. A wedding quilt is a symbol so powerful that even the most talented novice would be daunted by the task of stitching in mere days, a masterpiece worthy um, of the couple's bonds of love, commitment, trust, and hope for the future. Sarah turns to the uh, to the Elm Creek quilters, cherished friends who help her create a fitting tribute for a beloved daughter who will soon stand beside her husband in the union of their shared lives. As they pool their creative gifts, memories of Elm Creek Manor and of the women who have lived there in happiness and in sorrow spill forth, rendering a vivid something of family, friendship, and love in all its varieties. I... That's something, I just don't know what that word is. I've never seen it before, so I have no idea how to even try to pronounce that. So, a vivid picture of family, friendship, and love is what I'm guessing that means. Not positive. Okay. Um, the Christmas Box by Richard Paul Evans. <laughs> let's see. This one so begins the Christmas... Let's see. Whatever the reason, I find that with each passing Christmas, the story of the Christmas Box is told less and needed more. So I record it now for all future generations to accept or dismiss as it seems them good. As for me, I believe. And it and it is, after all, my story. So begins the Christmas box. The touching story of a widow and the young family who moves in with her. Together they discover the first gift of Christmas and all learn what Christmas is really all about. The Christmas box is a Christmas story unlike any other. So, Christmas fiction. There you go. All right. Okay, this next one is called The Lemon Jelly Cake, written by Madeline Babcock-Smith. Um, introduction by Dan, don't know how to say this guy's name, Gilroy. Mm. Almost guaranteed is a tonic for the headaches and stomach upsets common in the late 20th century. The Lemon Jelly Cake carries readers back to kinder, gentle, gent times in small town central Illinois at the turn of the century, evoking a forgotten America of lush lawns, bountiful summer picnics, shaded front porches, and gentle humor. The tale is set in an era where the day's toughest, toughest decision might have been what to serve for dinner or which suit or dress to wear. The Lemon Jelly Cake was a selection of literary guild and was serialized in Women's Day magazine. Oh, I know Women's Day! Um, it was in its 50th print, 5th, 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 5th printing when its author Madeline Babcock-Smith of Decatur died in December 1952 in this new Prairie State Books edition and introduction by longtime Millikinen University faculty member and Finley resident Dan uh, situates the book and its charming tale firmly in the center in the central Illinois of 1900. Okay, so it's a fiction, but it has an introduction by someone. So, okay, all right. Um, I, that's what I'm gathering from the back. I still don't know what, really what it's about. Okay, um, I have another nonfiction by, for Johnny Cash. <laughs> so, uh, it says, let's see. In Johnny Cash, The Life, Robert Hilburn conveys the unvarnished truth about a musical icon whose colorful career stretched from his days at Sun Records with Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis to the remarkable creative last hurrah at age 69 that resulted in the brave moving Hurt video. Okay. As music critic for the Los Angeles Times, Hilburn knew Cash well throughout his life. He was the only music journalist at the legendary Folsom prison concert in 1968, and he interviewed Cash and his wife, June Carter, for the final time just months before their deaths in 2003. Oh, 
Hilburn's rich reporting shows the remarkable highs and the deep lows that followed and haunted Cash in equal measure. A man of great faith and humbling addiction, Cash aimed for more than another hit on the jukebox. He wanted to use his music to lift people's spirits and help promote what he felt was the best of the American spirit. So, all about Johnny Cash. Okay, yep, she loved Johnny Cash's music. Okay, this next one is another biography or memoir of, I believe this one was an author, not a singer. It has pictures. And this one is all about John Wayne, My Life with the Duke by Pillar Wayne with Alex uh, Thorolfsson. So, John Wayne. She loved John Wayne. Let's see, The Big Trail, The Longest Day, The Green Bray, Brett's, Bray's, True Grit. I've heard of True Grit. I have not heard of the others. I have not seen any of these. These are movies synonymous with America, movies that formed many Americans' visions of their country. And John Wayne has formed many Americans' ideas of themselves, for themselves, and for the world. No one has had a great as no one has had as great an impact on American films. So it's all about John Wayne. Know nothing about him. I have not seen him in anything. I just have heard of him. So, and I know that my grandma loved his work. Okay, this one I think is part of a series as well. Uh, but I think this one's a cozy mystery. Uh, she got this one from a library book sale as well from here. Not my local library, but I'm sure it was like transferred over and then they just discarded it for whatever reason. So, surplus material it says. Okay, so this is Knitting Bones, a needlecraft mystery. Sounds like and looks like it's a cozy mystery. Written by Monica Ferris. So, let's see. Knitting Bones. As full-time owner of the Cruel World Needle Workshop and part-time sleuth, Betsy Devonshire has placed together quite a few murderous patterns in the USA Today best-selling needlecraft mysteries. But when she breaks her leg horseback riding, solving the latest crime becomes a group project. The stitchers of the Embroideries Guild are th thrilled to have raised over $20,000 for the National Heart Coalition, Coalition, I think it's Coalition, through pattern sales and a design contest, but they're less pleased when the representative who accepts the check at the annual convention disappears with it. It turns out that he's the husband of the local chapter president, Ali uh, Germain, who insists on his innocence. If Bob Germain didn't pocket the check, who did? And where is Bob now? Betsy's confined to her, confined to her apartment and loopy on painkillers. She can't possibly investigate. But Goodwin, her store manager, insists that he can do the legwork, even though Betsy worries that Goody might be a little creative for sleuthing. Uh, little do they know that a man across town also has a broken leg, and he too is wondering what happened to that check. Betsy and Goodwin have got to figure it out first, or it'll be a bad break for everyone. So, sounds like it's a cozy mystery, and I love cozy mysteries. Okay, next up, I think this one is also part of a series. This one is called Roses by Lila Meekum. So, there's that one. Um, let's see. Spanning the 20th century, this is the tale of the powerful founding families of how Butker, Texas, and how their histories intertwined over three intriguing generations. Cotton Tycoon Mary Tolliver and Timber Magnet Percy Warwick fell in love, but because of their stubborn natures and Mary's devotion to her family's land, they unwisely never wed. Now they must deal with the uh, deceit, secrets, and tragedies that surround them and the poignant loss of what might have been, not only for themselves, but also for the children who follow them. So, maybe a romance? I don't know. Okay, I'll find out when I re eventually read that one. Uh, next up, oh, these are both by Mary Higgins Clark, these next two books, and these are the last two books I have to tell you about. Uh, this one is written by Mary Higgins Clark and Alifair Burke. This one is called Every Breath You Take. So, 
that's that one. It says, Lori Moran's professional life is a, a success. Her television, sh television show, Under Suspicion, is a hit, both in the ratings and with its record of solving cold cases. But her romantic break from former host Alex Buckley has left her with an on-air talent she can't stand, Ryan Nichols, and a sense of loneliness, despite her loving family. Now Ryan has suggested a new case. Three years ago, Virginia Wakeling, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and one of the museum's most generous donors, was found dead in the snow after being thrown from the museum's roof on the night of its most celebrated fundraiser, the Met Gala. 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 I don't know. I don't know how to say it. The leading suspect, then and now, is her much younger boyfriend and personal trainer, Ivan Gray. Ivan runs a trendy, successful boutique gym called Punch, a business funded largely by the late Virginia, which happens to be the gym Ryan frequents. Lori's skepticism about the case is upended by a trip from her father's NYPD connection, and soon Lori realizes there are a bevy of suspects, including members of Virginia's trusted inner circle. As the under suspicion crew pries into the lives of a super wealthy real estate family with secrets to hide danger mounts for several witnesses and for Lori. So it sounds like this would be, it sounds like there's romance, but it sounds like it's a mystery. So I'm guessing it's like a romantic suspense. Okay. Uh, next up by Mary Higgins Clark is no place like home. This one says, 10-year-old Liza uh, Barton shoots her mother. Oh, that's not good. Uh, shoots her mother while trying to protect her from her violent husband, Liza's stepfather. That's really not good. While the death is ruled accidental, the tabloids still compare Liza to the child murderess Lizzie Borden. I've heard of Lizzie Borden. I want to read a book about Lizzie Borden. I really want to learn more about that. Uh, Liza's adoptive parents change her name to Celia and try to erase all traces of her past. Widowed after a brief marriage in which she had a son, Jack, she remarries a young lawyer. Celia is happy until on her birthday her, uh, he presents her with a gift, the house where she killed her mother. Oh, okay. On moving in, they find the words, Little Lizzie's Place, Beware, painted in red letters on the lawn. When the real estate agent who sold the house to her husband is murdered, she becomes a suspect. Okay. As she struggles to prove her innocence, Celia and her little son are being stalked by the killer. <laughs> this one actually sounds really good. Okay. Um, I think this is the one I'm most excited about out of all of these books. So, yeah. So that's the haul. These, again, were my grandma's books. Uh, these are ones that I believe she read them or at least started them. I don't know if she finished them all. Um, I don't know if she read them all, but I'm guessing. But I don't know for sure. Um, but these are definitely ones with reading the synopsis on these are ones that I think she would have enjoyed if she did read them. So, yeah. So, eventually I'll get to them. But yeah, so these were all my grandmas, and now they live with me. So, that's it for now. Let me know if you've read any of these books. Um, or read anything by any of these authors. And yeah, so just talk to me in the comment section below. And until next time, stay true to yourself and enjoy a good book. And I'll talk to you later.